Well, it was already an emotional week for many people across these islands, but then yesterday, just as we were looking forward to the excitement and the entertainment of a new rugby season, all of us here at Premier Sports were left shocked and deeply saddened by the news of the passing of our great friend and colleague, Eddie Butler. He was one of the most popular figures in world rugby, one of the most distinctive voices in our sport. But he was, of course, a hero in Wales for long before his 30-year media career as a former national team captain and a lion. We are thinking of Eddie today, but of course our thoughts and our best wishes also go out to his family and friends. May he rest in peace. John Barkley and Stephen Ferris are with me here in studio and from Wales joining us via video link is Ross Harris. Ross, I know you worked with Eddie for many years. I'm sure this is a, a very difficult time for you personally. It is, Graham, as it must be for everyone who knew and, and loved Eddie. Um, he's, his voice has been a constant companion to us uh, who love our rugby in Wales. The soundtrack of a generation. Um, I listened to him uh, as a youngster when well, my love of rugby was beginning to grow and he, he did soundtrack so many iconic moments in not just Welsh rugby history, but sporting history, you know, his association with the Olympics as well is something that's uh, indelibly inked on people's minds and imaginations. Um, and it's just so difficult to process, um, you know, 24 hours on from, from learning that he's passed away. It still seems bizarre that someone with such zest for life, such vigour, uh, such a presence is no longer with us. A totemic figure in, in Wales who transcended the sport, as you say. Ross, what are you picking up? What has been the mood like there in the last 24 hours since, the, since that news has come out? It's interesting, Graham, because you mentioned it there. It's been a, it's a strange week. Uh, you know, news politics has been suspended virtually since the death of Queen Elizabeth. And, um, you know, Wales has, has been mourning the Queen all week. And now, of course, you know, a national treasure has passed away. And it's been interesting to see just the, the volume of tributes that have flowed um, Eddie's way since we learned the, the tragic news yesterday. If you look on social media, on the television, on the radio, wherever you care to look, um, the, the, the glowing tributes are just flooding in from all corners. You know, he was an icon in Wales, as you say, very proud Welshman and forever associated with this part of the world, but I think his his fame and um, and his celebrity transcended Wales. You know, we mentioned the Olympics. His last ever uh, piece of voiceover work was actually on the BBC for uh, the Queen and the coverage um, that was coming through our TV set. So up until the last moment, he was still adding that rich baritone and the way he described things to events as they were unfolding, which again makes it even even harder to process that he's no longer with us. But, but yeah, I, I think in this corner of the world, Graham, um, you, you will not find a bad word said about him. He was such a, a charismatic presence. And those who met him, those that knew him, uh, will tell you that despite the fact he had this kind of towering intellect and he was always, almost always the brightest person in the room, he wore that very lightly. He never made anyone feel inferior or insignificant. He was the most gracious, uh, humble and welcoming person you could hope to meet, and he is going to be terribly, terribly missed. Stevie, you had the privilege of working with Eddie a few times for, for Premier Sports. What are your memories of him? Yeah, well, firstly, very, very shocked to, to hear of the news, like everybody. And yes, he has passed on, but he certainly left his mark. Um, I think in rugby, for me, you know, he was the voice of, of rugby. I know Bill McLaren, in a lot of people's eyes, was the voice of rugby, but for me, that's a, a different generation. And Eddie Butler, you know, one of my caps playing against the All Blacks and he was doing the world feed commentary and I scored my first try for, for Ireland against the All Blacks and, and he was you know, saying my name going across the line and, you know, just recapping and, and, and going through some old clips, you know, he, his voice just resonates with so many people and it's just such a huge loss. He commentated on you obviously as a player as well, John, but as we were saying earlier, he, he, he transcended the sport, he was, he was bigger than the sport in many ways. Yeah, like the guys have pretty much hit the nail on the head there. I think our careers are 
completely interlinked. Like Steve, he's a generation for us. He was the voice of our generation. So I actually got a message from my wife about it saying this is, this is so sad uh, to hear. And I, of course it's so sad, but for my wife to know that who doesn't particularly watch rugby or wouldn't know. And I said, oh I, yeah, when we talked about it, I said, there's a familiarity, a comfort to hearing his voice. Um, even if you don't know who Eddie Butler is, if you don't, if you don't know what he looked like, you turn in the Six Nations, you turn on a game of rugby, there's a comfort and a charisma that comes with it. So for me, that, that kind of really summarised it quite nicely that the man my wife who doesn't watch a lot of rugby despite me playing it <laughs> would still know his voice and, and, and feel a comfort from that. A lot of that, Ross, is down to the, the power of those long soliloquies that he was able to, to script. They were so poetic. They were the opener of every Six Nations Championship going back for decades. Where did that style come from and, and, and how did that evolve? Yeah, as, as I mentioned, a fiercely intelligent bloke, a, a master of, of not just the English languages, English language, he was uh, fluent in French and Spanish as well, studied them at Cambridge. Um, so he, he came from a, a very educated background. And it was it was quite amusing, actually, because, you know, he made his name playing for Pontypool, who at the time were the, the fiercest and, and one of the nastiest sides in, in British rugby. No one wanted to go up to Pontypool Park on a wet Wednesday night and, and take on the Viet Gwent and the Pontypool front row and... <laughs> Eddie Butler ended up captaining that side and he was really was a square peg in a round hole because they were all kind of hearty, working class valley boys. And here comes this Cambridge graduate with a posh accent. Um, but he just fit right in because going back to what I said earlier, you know, he walked into any room and he would make friends with anyone. He had previous acquaintances he'd recognise across the room. Everyone was his friend. You know, he didn't differentiate. Uh, he welcomed everyone into the industry. Um, and, and those soliloquies you mentioned, you know, that that is just who he was. That was his unique gift. I don't think there was any more singular voice in sports broadcasting. Um, you know, and what a sport like rugby, such a testosterone fueled macho sport. You think that maybe uh, applying that kind of poetic touch wouldn't fit right in, but it was perfect, wasn't it? You know, his commentary was so different to to the norm, and he could describe a game with. A poet's eye. I don't think I'm over exaggerating by saying that. He had such a, a wonderful way with words. And it was the economy of style as well. You know, the tendency is with broadcasters, and we're all guilty of it from time to time, is to fill the space, to fill the air. But Eddie had that awareness that actually sometimes silence works better than sound. And, and often it's just a choice word. You know, one carefully chosen word can be so much more effective than 10 and he just seemed to have that effortlessly you know he transitioned from being a player to being a broadcaster and he didn't seem to go through that apprentice phase that a lot of us seem to do where we're finding our feet he just kind of seamlessly strode onto the stage and uh, you know he was the doyen uh, almost at the start of his career and he certainly was by the end one of the things he certainly didn't use to fill the silence uh, Stevie is stats he famously didn't turn up with sheets and sheets of yeah. notes like most of us need and do at every game. Yeah, I worked with him on a, on a few occasions and when you stand beside him and I have all these notes written down of a many tackles somebody made the previous week and he's got the team sheet and two or three different notes, but he must have had a, a photographic memory because he did digest all the information that he's probably read on players over the last you know, two or three decades and, and if there's a break in play, he's straight away he's got a story uh, about one of the players from four or five years ago in an international match or an injury that he that he had and he's able to uh, verbalize that to, to the audience and I totally agree with Ross like coming into the broadcasting world you find that you have like a verbal ticks where you you know you say things too many times and you know you might get a tap on the shoulder from your boss to you know give you a little bit, bit of direction but he was faultless in everything that he said and and everything made sense you know, and in rugby terms, that's, that's pretty difficult to do week in, week out in rugby matches. John, have you made that transition yourself from, from player to, to media and, and, and co-commentator? I presume you have nothing, but respect has grown even more whenever you started to do what, what Eddie had to do a few decades back. Yeah, and one of my interactions when I first started commentating, like Steve says, is people think it's an easy thing to do and to come in and speak. And you see people like him and, and he came up to me and similar to what Ross was saying, he said, just let it breathe, you know, don't worry, you know, but it's kind of we're in this together. So he was always so, so kind. And, and I think for me, going back to what I said earlier, when you, when you hear his voice, there's very few voices that I hear that give me goosebumps. And like watching Six Nations montages, there's so much to be learned from the way he did it, the way he delivered. 
his poetic approach to commenting on rugby, which a complete juxtaposition, rugby and poetry, they shouldn't really go <laughs> together, you know, a barbaric pursuit and the beauty of poetry, but he's managed to combine them in a way which shouldn't really have worked, and there's so much beauty in what, in what he's left behind. I always liked the way he used to prod Brian Moore a little bit as well <laughs> during commentary, <laughs> just to rile him up, and he was very good at getting the best out of people. Ross, he wasn't afraid to voice strong opinions on the game, Either he had, he had interesting opinions on the way the game in Wales was going and perhaps where it should go. Yeah, and because Eddie was, was so fiercely intelligent, people listened to what Eddie said. You know, if he came out with some proclamation or other about the state of the game in Wales, you knew it, it wasn't some ill-considered rant. You knew he'd sat down and thought about it because he really genuinely cared about the game. It was a, an enormous passion of his, along with many other things and and yeah he he was um, controversial at times and and he didn't follow the herd you know he was he was more than willing to stick his head up above the parapet because he had the courage of his convictions um and and somewhat incongruously as well you know he became later in his life a, a very outspoken advocate for welsh independence um which it wasn't the kind of thing you'd expect from someone of his background you know born and raised in monmouthshire the easternmost of, of the, the counties of Wales, not particularly a, a Welsh-speaking stronghold or, or a, a Welsh nationalist stronghold. You tend to associate the independence movement with different parts of the, the country, but he, he really stuck to his convictions on that and became a kind of tub-thumping advocate for Welsh independence and, and made some pretty rousing speeches on that matter. So his, his passion extended way beyond rugby and, and into politics and, and the arts and, and all kinds of things. Briefly and finally, Ross, what does it say about Eddie that he died giving of himself to charity? You summed up perfectly there. You know, he, he did so much for charity that went unnoticed. He didn't do it in a self-aggrandizing way. He didn't do it to get attention. Um, he, he just he gave so generously of his time. And, and, you know, a friend of mine lost his father to, to prostate cancer and, and helped uh, set up a charity in the, in the wake of that. And, and Eddie trekked all through Ecuador with him over multiple volcanoes uh, to raise funds for, for the same charity he was raising funds for this time around. It, it just sums him up, you know, a kind of selfless, um, generous, lovely man.